Okay, uh, I think we are now live once again. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Quarantine Thermo. Um, today, um, we're very well, very pleased to, to welcome uh, Dr. Benjamin Yadin uh, from the University of Nottingham. Um, as you can see, we're using a slightly different technology. So we've been kind of roaming around the different kind of options of, of video conferencing software in the last uh, 10 minutes or so. And this is what we settled on that seems to work. So I hope that it continues to work. Um, but yeah, so um, I'm very pleased to, to have uh, Benjamin presenting today. So Benjamin's a, an expert in, in quantum thermodynamics and the foundations uh, sort of, of, of thermodynamics and quantum coherence theory. Um, and he's going to be telling us uh, today about a very interesting kind of foundational problem, which, which ties in very nicely with the talk that we had from from Zoe Holmes, uh, I think last month or, or whenever it was. So um, before we start, I'll just do the usual thing um, and explain the format to any um, any sort of new viewers we have. So basically, Benjamin is going to speak uh, uninterrupted for however long he wants, um, and then at the end of the talk, we'll have questions and answers. So if you have any questions during the talk or at the end, um, please just write them in the YouTube chat window. And please make sure it's clear um, what your name is so I know who's asking um, and try and just give as much detail in the question as you can, just so I understand what you're asking um, when I look back at it 20 minutes later, let's say. So, um, um, but yeah, same, same, as, same as always. So um, without further ado, uh, I'll hand over to Benjamin. Um, you're already sharing your screen, so you can just take it away, Benjamin. Okay, um, thank you very much for the um, opportunity to present this work. Um, it's nice to have these extra chances, especially when um, you know, travel is, is somewhat uh, restricted. Okay, um, so I'm going to be talking about a piece of work uh, that uh, Gerardo has extracted from two distinguishable Benjamins. Um, ben Morris is a PhD student um, in the group in Nottingham, and I'm a postdoc in the group at the moment. Um, so first, a, a couple of words about paradoxes in physics. Um, so why do we um, often think about paradox in physics? Well, the they're very good ways of indicating when there are gaps in our understanding of something. So there are yeah, lots of famous ones. On the right here, we have a, a portion of the list of paradoxes in physics from Wikipedia. Um, so some famous ones, the EPR paradox, that entanglement, um, the uh, grandmother paradox, the black hole information paradox from relativity. And today I'm going to be talking about the Gibbs paradox in thermodynamics. Um, and this was something that Gibbs wrote about towards the end of the 19th century, and it concerns the, the role of indistinguishability and the degree of control of an observer in thermodynamics. So first, just to recap what this original Gibbs paradox was. So if you think about an ideal gas in a box, um, let's say we have n particles uh, in a volume V, so V is half of the box. And this is in, in equilibrium with a heat bath externally at temperature T. Um, and then, of course, from the ideal gas law, it follows that when you let the uh, gas expand isothermally to double its initial volume, <clears throat> then you find that there's a corresponding entropy change, which is n log 2. And this entropy change um, comes along with an amount of work that the gas can perform on, say, a piston, which might lift a weight, for example. Okay. And now you can ask, well, what if I fill both sides of the chamber with different gases, let's say, um, and then I let them both expand? Well, then it, it's fairly intuitive that the amount of entropy that you get is, is double that for, the, for a single gas, and so it's just twice n log 2. But then the, the paradox comes in when you think, well, what if the two gases weren't different, but, but actually the same gas? Um, and then you would think, well, the entropy change would be zero because these two gases are already in equilibrium. And there's no way they can possibly uh, extract any. You can, there's no way you can possibly extract any work because they're not going to be pushing on any kind of barrier. And it appears from this that there might be some kind of contradiction between these two results. So, specifically, what if I make the the difference between these two gases, so the, the yellow one and the blue one, what if I make them negligible? So what if it's a, a detail in the gases that doesn't really interfere um, with the, the physics of, of the system? So what if the, the barrier doesn't care about what the colors of these gases is? Um, 
does it still make sense to say that there is an entropy increase here? Now, historically, this was seen as a problem with making the entropy an extensive function. And so the, the way that Gibbs and Boltzmann approached this was to introduce a, a correction factor, if you like, of, of one over n factorial into the way that we count microstates in statistical mechanics. So just as a very kind of um, hand wavy argument for how this works, suppose that um, so omega is our um, number of microstates for a given macrostate. Let's just say this is this goes like volume to the power of n, so just hand wavily. Then the entropy is a log of the number of microstates. And this is n log v. And now we can consider the entropy of, of a gas in the box in, in two different ways. We can consider it firstly as uh, two parts of a whole. If you do that, then you have two lots of uh, n particles in, in the volume v. So you have 2 times n log v. Um, whereas if you consider it as 2n particles in the volume of 2v, then you have this other result, which is 2n log 2v. And these, of course, aren't equal, which is a problem. Now, instead, um, what Gibbs and Boltzmann did was said that, we, well, we should really be dividing by a factor of n factorial because these particles are indistinguishable, so it doesn't matter how you reorder them. And if you do that, you compute your entropy. And if you use um, Stirling's formula for a large particle number, you get the slightly different formula here for, uh, for large n. And when you do the corresponding calculations for the, these two different pictures, you find that they match up. So the entropy is indeed a, an extensive function. And so this is the way they mathematically fix the problem. Now, uh, it took a while for um, people to, to realize perhaps some slightly deeper implications about this. So specifically, uh, James writes very nicely about this in, in 1992. Um, I'll just quote uh, one thing from, from this paper. It says, uh, the amount of useful work that we can extract from any system depends obviously necessarily on how much subjective information we have about its microstate, because that tells us which interactions will extract energy and which will not. This is not a paradox, but a platitude. So in particular, what um, James is thinking about is you could have two different kinds of observer, one which he calls an informed observer who can tell the difference between these two different gases. And that means that, in theory at least, they could um, design a system where you have a, a piston that interacts only with one kind of gas and a different piston which acts um, interacts with the other gas. So here you have the, the blue one is pushed on by the blue particles, but is, um, is, is untouched by the orange ones and vice versa. And if you came up with such a hypothetical device, then, then what would happen is the two gases would uh, expand independently and, and each um, do work. And therefore, it would make sense operationally to say that there is an entropy increase of 2n log 2. Now, the other observer is called an ignorant observer. And this is someone for whom there is no practical difference between these gases. And for them, they have a different set of tools available in their laboratory, if you like. So they only have um, devices available which interact in the same way with these two kinds of gases. Um, and James' argument was, well, if you, if you consider such a device, then actually the ignorant observer won't be able to extract any work from the setting, even if the two gases were actually different. And therefore, it makes good operational sense to say that the entropy change is zero. So there's really no contradiction here. The entropy change is something that is observer dependent, um, but it depends on how much control each observer has over the system in their laboratory. OK. So what we're doing is, is adding a quantum twist to this. Um, it's often argued that when you consider um, fundamentally indistinguishable quantum particles, that this somehow makes the situation simpler. Um, we're arguing that there's actually an additional rich, richness in structure that comes along from this. Um, so we'll be talking about uh, identical bosons and fermions and, um, and, and getting some kind of new effects that you don't see in the classical case. Um, it uh, requires a very careful analysis of, of how these of the state spaces look and how you count microstates and so on. Um, and just to clarify, there's nothing philosophical really here. We're not claiming that there's actually a paradox. 
It's just that the, the physics is very different from the Pascal case. Um, also, this is going to be quite abstract in the sense that uh, it will take rather simplistic toy models just to illustrate the, um, the, the fundamental statistical mechanics at, at the bottom of this. Um, and we're not really concerned at the moment with, with uh, proposing a, a feasible experiment. Um, it's worth pointing out recent works on this. Um, so, for example, uh, Zoe Holmes gave, gave a, a talk in Quarantine Thermo a few weeks ago about these two papers. What one, which is also about Gibbs mixing, another one, which is on, on a related topic with um, work extraction from bosons. And there's, there's a few other papers which are certainly worth looking at. OK, so what's our model? Um, very simple. We imagine we have a box with two sides, which are the same size. Each of them is, is populated with uh, D over two, uh, what we call cells. So we, we can think of these in, in position space, but that's not strictly necessary. It's just a set of D over two different states that each particle can occupy on each side of the box. We start with N particles on each side, um, initially thermalized at some temperature T. Um, and the idea is that we distinguish these two different gases by uh, a degree of freedom, which we call a spin. So this doesn't have to be a, a physical spin, but it's just some um, degree of freedom with, with two, two values, basically. So in the, in the classical case, this would just be a label, which can either be up or down. In the quantum case, this would be uh, a qubit. Um, now, the uh, Hamiltonian is zero, so all of these cells are up to generate energy. So that's, that's the model. Um, and the way that we describe the difference between the, these observers, the informed and ignorant ones, is the, the way in which uh, they have in, the amount of information they have about the gases. So um, the informed observer is able to measure the spin degree of freedom and the ignorance of is not allowed to measure it. So in other words, their dynamics have to be totally spin independent. One thing you might ask first about this model is, is it too naive? Um, so firstly, if the Hamiltonian is zero, is it really sensible to talk about thermodynamics and extracting work? Well, um, so in these kinds of settings, what we would generally imagine is that the system is coupled to some external heat bath at a fixed temperature and a work battery. Um, which is able to absorb changes in, in, in energy. And of course, total energy is conserved across all of these subsystems. Um, now, the way we're going to quantify the extractive work is just by using the quantum version or classical version of the um, Helmholtz free energy, uh, which in particular, because the Hamiltonian is zero, just re reduces down to the, in the quantum case, the, the von Neumann free energy. So. Uh, the extracted work is just going to be given by the, the or KBT times the change in entropy. Um, now I'm aware that there are the, there are a lot of a lot of subtleties, especially in the quantum case, um, about talking about these free energies. There there are other free energies, such as single shock free energies, that you can consider. Um, it, however, it turns out this is really sufficient for our case. Um, I'll be talking a little bit later about uh, work fluctuations as well. Um, but this will this will serve as a good enough figure of merit. Now, um, the other question you might have is, how can this a model this simple possibly uh, model an ideal gas? Um, well, it turns out actually that even in the classical cases, it's already known that quite simple kind of combinatorial counting arguments are sufficient to recover a lot of the statistical features of an ideal gas. Um, so in particular, you could have a look at these um, papers from a special issue in Entropy in 2018 about the Gibbs paradox. And we'll see um, in just a second how this works in the classical case. OK, um, so this is the analysis in the classical case. And the idea is to do this analogously to how we treat the quantum case, just to check that we're really playing the same game here. Now, let's think about the informed observer first. So first, uh, in their initial state, so they have n particles on each side. Each of those particles can be in any of d over 2 cells. Um, and there's a uniform probability distribution over all of these possibilities. So um, 
you can just count the number of ways of distributing n particles over d over two cells. And, and bearing in mind that we're allowed to have more than one particle occupying the cell, uh, the formula for this is just given by this um, binomial coefficient. This is quite a, a common thing that appear in, in statistical mechanics of indistinguishable particles. So um, you get this for both sides of the box, and therefore your initial entropy is just two times the log of this binomial coefficient. Now, what about the final state, the fully thermalized state after you've let down the barrier in the case where the, the gases are identical? Well, then you just have two n particles distributed over d cells. You just change your binomial factor to have a 2n and a d in it. And so this is the form of your final entropy. Whereas if the gases were different, then what the informed observer is allowed to do is to let them expand independently and extract work from them separately. And if you count the number of different microstates that, that there are in this final state, um, you find that it's twice times the log of this uh, binomial coefficient where you have each, um, each gas has n particles distributed over d cells. Okay. So the, these formulas clear up a bit if you consider a macroscopic limit, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but first, what about the uh, ignorant observer? So in the initial states, nothing changes. It's exactly the same as for the informed observer. Also, um, in the case where the gases are identical, it's fairly obvious that nothing really changes. However, the situation does change a bit when you um, consider gases that are actually different. So the crucial thing here is that uh, because the, um, the ignorant observer only has access to spin independent dynamics on their whole system, um, as far as the physics is concerned, all that matters is the number of particles in each cell and not the spins. So for example, these two kinds of configurations here where you have an up and a down versus two ups look the same. Um, and it's fairly obvious from that, from that logic that the entropy change they calculate should be exactly the same as for identical gases. Now, there are, there are some subtleties in the analysis here if you really want to be rigorous about it. Um, and to be honest, in, in our current version of the archive paper, um, we realized we hadn't quite dealt with it clearly enough. So hopefully in the next version, this will become clearer. Or if anyone wants to know about these subtleties, then feel free to ask later. OK, so let, let's see what happens in the macroscopic limit. Well, what does this mean? Well, we, we take a large number of particles, n is much greater than 1. And then we also let d go to infinity. So we take uh, the limit where there are vastly more cells and particles, or in other words, the box becomes a continuum. And if you do this um, in this table, you, you can tabulate these different entropy changes. And this recovers um, what exactly what we expect from the classical case of an ideal gas. So uh, for identical gases, you have uh, no entropy change. For different gases, the ignorant observer also has no entropy change. But the informed one recovers this 2n log 2. Now, this approximately zero uh, actually means that it's of order log n. Um, so it's not technically zero, but it, it's negligible compared with the, the linear amount that you get for this 2n log 2. Um, and where this comes from is, is just the fact that your initial state has precisely n particles on each side, whereas in the final state, you have some fluctuations around the mean. Um, but these and turn out not to really contribute significantly to the entropy. So this is just the, yeah, the summary of the classical case. And unsurprisingly, um, the ignorant observer, not knowing the difference between these two, two different spin values, can't extract any more work when the spins are different than when they're the same. So now onto the quantum case. But this requires quite a careful look at the structure of the Hilbert space. So let's first think about um, the single particle Hilbert space, which is we call, we call H1. So th um, the particles have two different degrees of freedom. They have the what we call the, the position, which is which cell they occupy. This is just a, as a basis going from, from 1 to D. 
and they have a spin which is of course either up or down. Now when you look at uh, bosons and fermions, you take the, the n-fold tensor product of this single particle Hilbert space, but then you also have to project onto the subspace where you have either fully symmetric or fully anti-symmetric uh, wave functions. Um, so the symmetry here is referring to the symmetry of the, the wave function under permutations of particle labels. So the, the thing about identical bosons or fermions is that um, the, the labels of the particles don't really have any physical meaning. Um, so that, that, that's, if you like, one reason why you project onto these subspaces. Um, now these permutations of particle labels, they act simultaneously on the position wave function and on the spin wave function. Okay, so we, we have to think about how the symmetries of these two different parts, the spin and the spatial part, um, combine to give an overall symmetric or anti-symmetric wave function. So just to take a, a familiar example from atomic physics, uh, suppose you have two boxes, um, or two cells rather, and you have one particle in each cell. Um, there are different ways you could choose them to be up or down. There's these four different alternatives. Um, and then there, there are these different symmetric or anti-symmetric wave functions that you can, you can, you can think of. So for bosons, because the overall wave function is symmetric, that means that the symmetries of the two parts have to pair up in the same way. So whenever the uh, spatial part is symmetric, then the spin part must be somewhere in this symmetric subspace. Um, whereas whenever the uh, spatial wave function is anti-symmetric, then the spin wave function also has to be anti-symmetric. And for fermions, you have overall anti-symmetry, and all that changes is that these these parts have to, these symmetries have to pair up in the opposite way. Um, now you should also note that along with the symmetries here, um, you have these angular momentum quantum numbers referring to the spin. So minutes. Okay. So um, sorry. Yeah, okay. So I think we are hopefully. Uh, let me just check that we're back up. Yeah. So. Um, Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, I think we are now back up. Um, and sorry, Benjamin, I'm afraid you've just been talking to yourself for the last couple of minutes because I wasn't able no to, to tell you that we crashed. But um, I'm afraid I, I desperately need a new computer. So this is why uh, it's, it's rather struggling. So um, but anyway, um, let's so I know where we crashed. So basically, if you can go back to the point where you were just explaining okay um essentially this issue about um you know singlets and triplets being related to this to the spatial symmetry of the wave function uh exactly this slide so let me just go to okay. um full screen um uh, hold on a second um, do you, do you still see my screen or? yeah i still see your screen it's all it's all um okay. it's all fine i'll just go to the full screen um uh hold on just one second um so let me just sorry i just need to fix something quickly uh okay we're now on full screen okay you're now to the right of your uh, for some reason you're to the right of the slides instead of below them but i think that that's uh that's all okay um okay yeah so i think we're all fine sorry about that again everyone and yeah please uh so so go ahead benjamin okay yeah i'll give it a second shot then um hopefully it's better this time around um Okay, uh, I don't know how far back exactly to go, but I'll just say that, uh, okay, you, you have these, um, so when, whenever you have a, a symmetric spatial wave function, this must necessarily for bosons pair with a symmetric um, spin wave function, which also comes with a, a, a spin quantum number day, which is, which is a property of the, the total spin vector, that tells you about the length of the total spin vector. Um, and similarly with, uh, an anti-symmetric spatial wave function of this uh, symmetric singlet spin state, which is j, j equals zero. Uh, and for fermions, to get an overall anti-symmetric wave function, these two parts uh, pair up oppositely. And the important point here is that the, the symmetry of the spatial wave function has to pair up with this uh, j spin quantum number. 
Um, okay, so, so more generally, we have to use this trick from representation theory that's called Schurval duality. Um, it's not that important to go into the, all the details about this, um, but just to give a, I'll, I'll give a, a sort of a flavor of how it works. So if you just consider the, the spin part first, so you have these, the n, um, n copies of the, uh, sorry, the, the spatial wave function, n copies of that. This can be decomposed in a particular way, which is a, a sort of a block decomposition labeled by these things called lambda. And for each lambda, you have this uh, product of two parts. And the one on the left, uh, which we call h lambda, is something uh, which encodes the, well, which, which evolves under SUD. So in other words, if you were to um, rotate the uh, sp spatial wave function of each particle, then that acts on this Hilbert space. Whereas if you were to permute the particles, then this acts on, on this Hilbert space, the K lambda. Uh, so the, these lambdas are things from representation theory. They're called Young diagrams. Um, it's not really important right now what they are. They're basically just, uh, you can think of them as ways of partitioning um, the number n in, in different ways. Uh, D tells you the maximum number of rows you're allowed. Um, but essentially, it's a, a label for these different irreducible representations on the, under these groups. And the duality is the thing that tells you that these lambdas um, simultaneously represent um, both parts of these groups. OK, um, now. OK, sorry, yeah. uh, I mean. Yeah, I'm afraid I, uh, there's not really much that I can do about this. This is just, unfortunately, the, the rather tired state of my computer. Um, so I do apologize, uh, everyone, for this. Hopefully, um, hopefully it's going to work now. <laughs> okay, so we're back up. So if you want to, if you want to share screen again, Benjamin. Okay, uh, is it not sharing? Or? Uh, no, at the moment I'll try, I, don't, I'll try again. I don't see the presentation right now. Okay. Um... How is that? Yeah, that looks fine. Um, okay. I mean, uh, the only possibility, other possibility I'd suggest is perhaps turning off your video, just to, uh, that yeah, might reduce that. the load. Maybe we can try that and then we can turn it back on at the end. Yeah. Um, figure out how to do that. Um, okay. Yeah, that, may, let's see if that, that helps. Okay. Okay, thanks. Do you have a rough idea where it cut out before? Uh, it was on this slide. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't really give more sure. detail on, on exactly where. OK, um, no problem. But you'd got to um, this point. I mean, you'd, you'd already got through the, the Chervail duality and, and describing Young diagrams. Okay. I mean, it, it always doesn't hurt to go over things again, I guess. So, so. OK. Sorry about that. Um, no, no problem. All right. Um, Okay, just to summarize, I guess, fairly quickly, um, you do this de decomposition for both the spatial part and the spin part. And then if we're talking about bosons, which I will do um, for the rest of it for now, just because it's more or less the same for fermions, um, the fact that you have an overall symmetric wave function means that these lambda labels have to be the same for both parts, for the spin and, and spatial part. Um, and there's another simplification, which is that uh, because the spin part is just a two-dimensional subsystem, you can replace this um, this lambda with a, a, a J label. So this is exactly just the um, the spin quantum numbers I was talking about on the previous slide. Um, so the, the point about this is that um, the this uh, n particle Hilbert space actually decomposes in a block structure where you have different j's, which are referring to the uh, spin quantum number. And then for the spatial part, these j's also um, refer to a particular symmetry representation of the spatial part. Um, and, and, and they refer to a particular representation of SUD. So you have the, these different. Um, 
types of uh, spin uh, spatial wave function which pair along with the j for the spin. Okay, and now what's useful about this uh, this decomposition is it tells us how to describe these spin independent operations. So let's consider a global unitary U, which is coupling everything together to the system, the heat bath, and the work battery. Um, now, firstly, this ha has to act only on these HX factors, so not the spin part. And there's another uh, important assumption, which is that it must preserve the bosonic symmetry. Um, and this, this means you require that uh, this unitary commutes with permutations of the particles. So the, the upshot of that is that the unitary has to decompose in a block diagonal structure where this uj only acts on the, the, the spatial part of the wave function and there is an identity on the spin part. So you have this, this block diagonal structure and, and then so that these blocks have to evolve independently. And an important consequence of that is that um, the evolution under such a unitary is, is uh, constrained within each J block. So if you like, this J quantum number is, is conserved. And so this then lets us think how a state will evolve under such an operation. So let's say we have a state rho initially. The spin degree of freedom doesn't couple to anything, so you just trace it out. And you consider the, the reduced wave function for the x degree of freedom. Now, um, because of this Hilbert space decomposition, it has to look like a kind of uh, a block diagonal structure with over different j's. And it has some probability distribution, pj, for, for being each j block. Um, and because of this block diagonal structure of the unitaries, the final state actually has to have the same probability distribution over j, but just these different components um, of, of the the state, this row prime j, can be different. So this is the idea that the current observer can affect transformation of this type. And in order to get a maximal entropy change, they want to make this final state as mixed as possible. And in particular, that means you want to make each of these j blocks maximally mixed. And, and this is something you can actually do because of the fact that um, these blocks are irreducible representations. And, that's all fairly abstract, just as a straightforward example, again with two particles. If we start with the spin up on the left and the spin down on the right, this initial state you can actually decompose in the following way. So it has a 50% uh, probability of being in the j equals 1 symmetric subspace and 50% of being in the j equals 0 um, symmetric, uh, anti symmetric subspace. Now, so that these, these two things are your different blocks, probability distribution is just 50-50. And if you consider what the ignorant observer is allowed to do, um, they can change this symmetric superpositions of ones and twos into any mixture of these three triplet states. Whereas for the j equals zero block, this is a single state, it's in a one dimensional subspace, and so it, it can't change. Um, so overall, basically, if you calculate the entropy change for this for this uh, this process, you find that with 50% probability, you get log three in the three-dimensional subspace, and 50% probability, you get log one or, or zero. That's the basic idea. Um, and so what we've derived is a, a general result now for what this maximum entropy change looks like for the ignorant observer. Um, and if you look on the right, Actually, the, so this minus quantity, this is exactly the same as the classical initial entropy. And the thing that's really different is this sum over pj log dj. OK, so what are these different things? These pjs are the dimensions of these um, Hilbert spaces. Um, they depend on the number of particles and the number of cells. We, we've got a straightforward formula for it, but it's, it's fairly ugly, so I didn't put it on the slide. Um, and these probabilities pj, um, these are found by thinking about how you couple spins together. So just as a kind of sketch of how we do it, um, because you have n particles with all the same spin on each side, 
you can basically lump them together and think about each side as being one big spin with, with a, lo a longer spin vector. And then it reduces to a, a two spin coupling problem. So that, that's sort of the, the idea of that. And again, you get a fairly straightforward formula. It's, it's not too hard to compute. So kind of to summarize what this gives us, um, when you have identical gases, this means that everything is spin up. And that means your, your spin vector is maximal. So you only you are only in this j equal n subspace. Your, your probability distribution pj is, is, is sharp. And you get p of n is 1, and all the others are 0. And actually, the, these this dimension dj here is actually the dimension of the um, symmetric subspace for bosons. Anyway, the, 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 the result about that is that you get exactly the same formula of the entropy change for both observers and exactly the same as in the classical case. Well, now, what's more interesting is when you consider two different gases. So here there's now some non-trivial distribution over the, over the j's. Um, the informed observer gets exactly the same as the classical formula, but the ignorant observer changes. Now, what's a good sanity check is that the ignorant observer can never extract more than the informed one. Um, however, what is important is that the ignorant observer can extract more than in the classical case. So here are some plots to demonstrate this. So on the left here, we have uh, four particles on each side. And this is the entropy change as a function of d, the number of cells in the box. So at the top here, you have this, this dotted line is the 2n log 2 classical ideal gas formula. And you see now that the, the green one is for the absor uh, informed observer, which can either be quantum or classical. It's the same answer. And you can see that as you make uh, the box go to continuum, it does, as I said before, it does approach the ideal gas result. At the bottom, this uh, dotted line here is for the ignorant classical observer. And you see again that it's, it's a non-zero but negligible um, entropy increase. And now that this interesting one is the one in the middle, the red line is the ignorant quantum observer. And you can see, firstly, that it goes above the, the classical version. Um, and that it also saturates to some maximum as you increase d. Um, but there is a gap between between the two observers. Now on the right we've got a larger particle number and you can say you can see much the same behavior except that this gap between the green and red line is now narrowed at least sort of proportionally. But this is uh, what we call the low density limit um, and, and we can actually derive uh, an expression for the, the gap between the two observers. Um, so this involves the, the Shannon entropy of this uh, probability distribution pj and then another a small correction which is, is not so important um now the really interesting thing is, is what happens when you take large particle number whoops um and then let me find that this entropy hp goes as log n so that's rather striking because it means that both of these values for both uh, both quantum informed and ignorant observers 10 to 2n log 2, um, because the the next so the next leading contribution for the uh, ignorant observer is is order log n, so it's negligible compared with the the actual value. So in other words, the fact that the ignorant observer doesn't know the spin and can't interact with it actually doesn't uh, hinder them at all in this macroscopic limit. And so if you like, this is kind of a kind of a paradox, well, it appears a bit paradoxical. Um, one thing you should probably ask at this stage is, what about fluctuating work? So I haven't really touched on this properly yet. Um, so we have this probability distribution pj. So what actually happens is that for each j, <clears throat> you can deterministically extract a certain amount of work. Um, and then there are obviously fluctuations in this j. And what we've actually computed so far is really the mean entropy change. Um, so to look at fluctuations, you, you can check the variance of this, of this entropy change, um, how it varies with J. Um, and again, so if we look in the, <clears throat> the limit of large number and low density, 
you can get a, a simple approximation for this probability distribution. And the variance comes out to be a constant, so about point, uh, 0.411. Um, and this is constant compared with the linear value for the, the mean entropy change. So really, the fluctuations are negligible. So you, this is a effectively deterministic, if you like. OK. And now I'm going to try and give a, a sort of semi-proof to um, give some intuition for why this low density limit um, has the result that it does. So one simplification that happens is that it's very unlikely in this limit that two particles will be in the same place. So you can say that uh, with probability almost one, you have at most one particle per box. So you have these, these things which we call cell configuration. So if you like, this is just a choice of, of which boxes are occupied by a particle. Uh, and there are D choose 2n of these, um, 2n is a total number of particles. And these are basically the microstates that the classical observer sees because we don't know the spin value. Now, for each cell configuration, there are also different spin configurations, so different ways of putting up and down spins into these boxes. And the number of ways of doing that is 2n choose n. You just choose which n of the boxes have up and which n have down. So let's just say, without lots of generality, that we've occupied boxes 1 up to 2n, uh, cells rather. Um, and then the different spin configurations, are, you can think of them as different ways of permuting uh, the state here. So um, this is. is this is not a first quantile state, so the, these labels here are referring to different boxes, not to different particles. So this is saying we can really think of each box as a qubit, which either contains a, an up particle or, or a down particle. Um, and so there are different ways you can obviously permute the, the up and down choices in these two n boxes. Now, the, the crucial question is, how much information do you lose when you trace out the spin part to the wave function. Um, and of course, classically, um, you lose everything apart from just the, the cell configuration because you have no idea which of these ups and downs. Whereas in the quantum case, we have something different. Um, so again, we make use of this sure of all duality. You, you decompose these um, 2n box. Uh, sorry, cell states that you can think of as qubits. Um, and you can do it in the same way where there's, there's a kind of block diagonal structure with different j's. And you have a part that um, follows the representation under uh, the spin rotations and a part that encodes the, the behavior under permutations of these different cells. And what this structure really means is that you have a, a special basis, which can be labeled by three three values, so j, m, and p. Um, j is just the same as before, this total spin quantum number. m is actually the, the magnetic spin quantum number, so it's um, a half number of up minus number of downs, which, which is zero anyway. Um, and p is something that um, exists in this uh, permutation subspace. Now, the important thing is that actually these, these m's, well, they're, they're always all fixed to be zero. So, and tracing out the spin degree of freedom basically just means uh, forgetting what the value of m is. Now, that's crucial because what that means is you, know, you, you lose no information upon tracing out the spin. So in other words, all of these different states are completely orthogonal as far as the ignorant observer is concerned. And there are precisely as many of the, as many of those as there are spin configurations. So that's again a bit a bit abstract. I'll just give an example to explain what that means. So once more, consider two particles and two cells. Classically, if we change which of these were up and which were down, the ignorant observer wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Whereas in the quantum case, you can form these superposition states. So one is the symmetric. Superposition of these two different configurations, and the other one is the anti-symmetric superposition. 
Um, a, a more complicated example, the three plus clauses that's below. The, the point about this is that they are um, these are superposition states, which rather surprisingly can be all distinguished by the ignorant observer. And there, there are exactly as many of these states as there are different spin configurations. So for example, this, in this case with spin, uh, three particles, you see that there are three different basis states and, that, and exactly the same way as, as uh, the same number of ways distributing up and down particles, these two ups and one down across three cells. So this really explains why in the low density limit, you don't lose any information by, by tracing out spins. Okay, now just a few words about the underlying mechanism here. So it's closely related to this uh, Hong Mandel effect in quantum optics. So just as a, a recap, what this effect is, if you take two photons of, of the same polarization and put them at a non-polarizing beam splitter, you can arrange the phase in such a way that um, either both particles go left or both particles go right. So you get photon bunching. And then when you put um, photon number counters, you get uh, either zero or two clicks on each side, and they're always perfectly anti-correlated. Um, now, whereas if you had two different polarizations and, and you put them at the same beam splitter, <clears throat> you would instead find that the particles then distribute independently. They can each go either way, and you'd get some different distribution of, of, uh, of numbers. It could be zero, one, or two on each side. Now, what's important here is that the, the operations are spin independent. So you've used a non-polarizing beam splitter and also a, a number detector, which, which can't tell the difference between different polarizations. So in other words, this apparatus is within the repertoire of the ignorant observer. But what it's allowed them to do is distinguish between different internal spin configurations. And so that's why it's not necessarily surprising <clears throat> that we get these different uh, outcomes in, in the quantum case, where, whereas they would look the same in the classical case. Um, now, finally, you might want to get a sense for how <clears throat> how complex are these, these, these states that the uh, ignorant observer has to distinguish. Well, um, as you saw on the previous slide, they're, they're actually generally highly entangled states. And there is actually a, a circuit which is known to um, produce these, these what so called Chauval basis states from some computational basis. Um, this can be done efficiently, um, so it's polynomial in, in the number of particles and number of cells and, and, and logarithm of some error. Um, the point really here is this, this uh, circuit that creates these entangled states is, is a kind of generalization of the Fourier transform, um, which is, of course, an important um, subroutine in, in quantum computation. Um, and what that means is that there's obviously a sense in which these uh, states are highly complex. Um, and, and this explains why you don't really see this effect classically. It's because classically you might expect there's some kind of, of locality going on, which prevents you from seeing this, this uh, using the entanglement. OK, so just as a summary, this analysis really uh, reveals the, the important connection between the knowledge that an observer has and the degree of control they have. Um, and so we've analyzed that through the, the, the use of internal spin, which can't be seen by an ignorant observer. Classically, this spin really plays no role for the ignorant observer, but in the quantum case, it does. And the most striking fact is that um, in, the, in the limit of a large number of particles in, a, in, a, in an almost continuum box, um, actually, the uh, the fact that the ignorant observer can't address the spin poses no obstacle to the extracting as, as much work as the informed observer. So there's quite a few other questions that could be asked here. One that we're currently thinking about is partial distinguishability. So what if these 
different spin states and not orthogonal, you'd expect that you should be able to sort of tune the effect down smoothly to zero. Um, and another important one is, of course, turning the, the simple model into a concrete proposal. And may, maybe this is feasible for small particle numbers, perhaps. Um, it's worth comparing this with um, Holmes et al. paper, which was recently published in PRL, which um, shows a slightly different looking effect for work extraction from bosons. And um, it is worth seeing whether their proposal can be modified in some way to see our effect. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Benjamin. Uh, super interesting talk. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll just try and I'll see if I can bring my video back in, although maybe it's a bad idea, but, um, uh, ah, no, I didn't want to do that. No, I've just made it all about me. Hold on a second. Uh, let's go back to you. Okay, this is the fun of new technology. Uh, I guess I'll leave mine off as well. In case <laughs> okay, then maybe I'll just turn mine off. Um, okay, so um, let me just see if I can uh, actually get back your slides, though, because that's rather important. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Anyway, um, just, just while you guys uh, are exasperated by watching me be technologically incapable, um, I remind you that you can ask uh, questions at this point, and that's what we'll do now. Um, if I can ever get back to the presentation. Um, okay, so I can't see your slide. Yeah, now I can see your slides. Okay, good, good, good. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, we already had some questions, um, so I'll just go through through these. But um, yeah, I mean, I encourage anyone who has any questions at all to, to please feel free to just write them in the YouTube chat window. Um, lots of people already clapping and saying thanks for a nice talk. Um, so we had... Uh, a question kind of early on in the talk from from Ivan Henau, um, who said, uh, I have a, so hi all, I have a question. Uh, if the label distinguishing the gases is not physical, how can there be an, uh, how can an excess of work extracted for different gases be related to a difference in entropy change? Uh, since one could think in analogy with a Maxwell demon where labels would correspond to different velocities, but in that case, speed is a physical quantity. Um, guess I'm not quite understanding what was meant by unphysical quantity. So, I mean, the, the spin is, is supposed to be a, a really a physical degree of freedom that is there, because this is something that uh, an informed observer who has sort of sufficiently precise measurement devices is allowed to access. Um, so that the constraint on the ignorant observer is really just an operational thing. It's saying that, for example, they, they have no, um, you know, if they, if they had a stern girl like a, apparatus in there, in their lab, then they would be able to access some spin degree of freedom. Whereas we're um, we're taking we're considering observers who don't have such um, control in their lab. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a question of, of uh, what's physical or not, it's just what what is accessible to a particular experimenter. Okay. Does that clarifies. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah. So. Um, Maybe well, there, so there's a bit of a delay. So maybe some people are writing questions, but um, perhaps I can ask a question um, while we wait. So mm -hmm. this uh, this thing about the low density limit, I found quite interesting um, mm -hmm. because so they're basically when the particles are sufficiently far apart, usually then essentially um, this kind of quantum symmetrization stops being important, right? Is that how I can more or less uh, interpret it? So uh, the, the reason why I'm asking is because it kind of seems to connect somehow. To something that I've always found kind of interesting, which is the question about, um, you know, how uh, how sort of close together, let's say, the two fermions have to be before you really have to take into account wave mm. function symmetrization or anti symmetrization. Yeah. I mean, do do you see what the point? Uh, that I'm yeah, this is, yeah, it, it's a very good question, and, and actually one that we've we've been discussing recently as well. So I, I think that you're right um, that the sort of the, the boson bosonicness or fermionicness. Um, you know, exchange symmetry doesn't actually matter in this limit, which kind of makes sense. Um, and actually, so I did have a slide at the end on, on fermions. I didn't show, but um, basically you, you get the, the same limit. So, um, right. And actually, you can sort of see that from, from the argument that I've given. The exchange symmetry hasn't played any role. Um, and 
this suggests to us also that, that the same low density limit would probably work if you had distinguishable particles, so non-identical bosons and fermions. But um, we, yeah, we, we have to think about how to treat this. Um, so kind of to summarize, really, the, the important effect in that limit seems to be that um, not so much that you you have a symmetric or anti-symmetric wave function, but that there are these different possible microstates that the um, ignorant observer has access to, which are kind of entangled states between these different cells. And, and that's what's not there classically. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these entangled states, I think, really don't depend on whether the, the particles are kind of fundamentally identical or not. But this is something we're still thinking about. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, perhaps we can discuss that again at some point. I um, um, find this rather rather nice. So um, anyway, let me move on to um, another question that we have from Nathan Myers, um, who says, uh, do you have any intuition about how this would be extended to statistics beyond bosons and fermions? For example, the anionic statistics that are observed in 2D systems? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I guess that partially relates to your previous question, um, in that probably the low density limit is the same. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how it would work with perennials, because I, I believe you, you don't have a first quantized wave function for anions. Um, mm. I, I don't, yeah, unfortunately, I don't really know much about them, but it's something certainly worth worth discussing. Okay, no, it's, that's interesting. Um, all right, uh, as I said, please feel free to ask further questions, guys. I mean, maybe I can ask a question. I mean, seeing as I know that you're an expert in kind of foundations and reference frames and this kind of thing, and I, I'm rather not, but um, so I just feel I take this opportunity to ask you. I mean, this this question actually about, um, you know, when you have to symmetrize or anti-symmetrize, is this somehow connected to, to the existence of a reference frame or not? I mean, because somehow, um, I mean, sorry, I'm I'm kind of harping on again about this low density limit, but I'm I'm I just would like to understand this this better. So I mean, um, yeah. perhaps even just more abstractly, I mean, if if I have two fermions in separate labs, I would assume that I don't have to anti-symmetrize the wave function, even if they are in principle identical. Um, is this somehow connected to to the absence of a reference frame? Because I guess I mean it, it, the reason why this connects here is that the ignorant observer doesn't have a reference frame that they that they could use to measure spin, right? I mean, that's why they're mm. ignorant. One can, is that correct that one can see it that way? Or... Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if there's, there's two slightly different issues there, perhaps. Okay. Um, so um, about whether you have to symmetrize the wave function when the particles are in different places, um, I'm not exactly sure how that connects to a reference frame, but it certainly seems to be true. That, that that seems to be effectively true in this low density limit, and that mm. the exchange symmetry seems to not matter. Um, but the thing about reference frames that is there is that yes, you, you can think of the loss of a, a spin degree of freedom as as the loss of a reference frame. Um, and so actually, yeah, this this result does mirror some other things that you get in the theory of reference frames. So, um, for example, if you try and encode. Um, Try, try and encode information into many copies of a system, so many different spins, mm -hmm. um, you find that the, the restriction um, of not having a reference frame does vanish in, in a large particle number limit. So it's clearly related to that. I see. OK, thanks. For so, that. Yeah, that's um, just a, yeah you, you could, so another way you could think about this is, is having, um, um, what's it called? Um, decoherence free subspaces um, so um, subspaces that that you know, yeah, re remain free of de decoherence even after losing this degree of freedom okay so sorry I th this this connection I didn't I didn't quite get so what, what it, where exactly is the decoherence free subspace I mean um, so if you um, if you think of the the loss of a spin degree of freedom as, as some process that averages over the, uh, I see, you know, I see. It rotates the spin randomly. So um, then you have subspaces that kind of remain unchanged un under that decoherence. Um, so you, you don't. This, this is kind of what it means to not lose information under um, that kind of decoherence process. 
I see, I see. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so I don't think we had any further questions, so um, maybe this is a good time to conclude before my computer explodes or something. Um, but um, yeah, so as always, thanks everyone for tuning in, and especially thank you so much uh, to Dr. Benjamin Yadin for a, a really interesting talk. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.